Will you please welcome to the stage, Brian Hughes. Hello. Hello. Well done. Uh, as you can see, I'm right-handed. You can see this from the microphone. And that actually is a real psychological test. It's called the Edinburgh Test of Handedness. You give somebody something, and you see what hand they use, and from that, you can discern whether or not they are right-handed or left-handed. Uh, it's deemed to be more reliable than self-report, because if you ask somebody to tell you what hand they use, they might forget, or they might uh, make a mistake, or they might even lie to you. But if you use the Edinburgh Test of Handedness, then you foil any such strategy of deception, and you can tell for real what hand they use. Now, the Edinburgh test of handedness, I really admire it. Mostly I admire the brass neck of developing such a test, <laughs> and naming it after Edinburgh. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Glasgow are terribly disappointed. <laughs> the test is 45 years old. It was developed and published in the same year that I was born. And this will tell you a lot about psychology. It's been cited, and I looked it up today, 22,372 times in 45 years. That's 497 citations a year. It's a citation classic. The Edinburgh test of handedness. Give somebody something, see what hand they use, and you've got a citation as well as a test result. <laughs> now, the second most cited paper that refers in the title to the Edinburgh test of handedness is a study of the reliability of the Edinburgh test of handedness. <laughs> where you give the Edinburgh test of handedness twice, and you see, is the second result the same as the first result? Uh, if it is, then you have high reliability. You can develop and compute a statistical coefficient of association between the two test scores. Interestingly, and this will also tell you a lot about how academics work, and psychologists in particular, that paper has been cited 77 times in the interim. <laughs> So compared to 22,372 citations of the actual test, we only have 77 citations of the reliability test. <laughs> to me, that is interesting. It tells us a lot about the human nature of psychology and of academia in particular. So it's great to be here at Bright Club because I want to talk a little bit more about those types of things. Bright Club is an important activity. It's academic outreach. And academics really love academic outreach. Uh, they have great fun with it, even if it takes the form of stand-up comedy. And I think you'll uh, recognize that most academics feel they can turn their hand to anything. Uh, we, we can certainly turn our hand to standing up. We've got that side of the whole equation <laughs> more or less nailed most of the time. The comedy, we, we, we just looked that up on Google Scholar. We just spent a few, a few hours centering variations of the term stand-up comedy into the, into, the, into the search box. We're looking for it all in the title, if possible. <laughs> we feel we can accumulate these skills. Academic outreach is also very important, and you know another thing about academics is that they're particularly good at stretching out and stringing out, and perhaps even repackaging and embellishing their <laughs> most banal accomplishments uh, and into glorious achievements. Uh, so this uh, uh, activity is certainly going to go in my CV. <laughs> Academic outreach is very important, and this event of Bright Club will probably go into my CV at least three different times, <laughs> in three different respects. Of course, economic outreach is important in its own right, but if I tell a joke and you laugh, I'm going to put that into my CV too. <laughs> We're going to put that under societal impact. <laughs> and if you actually get the joke, that's going to go down as knowledge transfer. <laughs> So, I'm a psychologist, as has been mentioned, and most of my research concerns psychological stress, and in particular, the impact of psychological stress on the human body. I look at things like cardiovascular function in particular. We look at blood pressure, heart rate, total peripheral resistance, coronary output, and various other things. We bring people into the laboratory, we expose them to psychological stress, and we basically just see what happens. Sometimes we look at uh, hormonal indicators like cortisol or Im immune markers like salivary immunoglobulin A. One of my colleagues in the Netherlands 
She measures the amount of water that gathers in the eye of the participant during ex exposure to psychological stress. Now you might call that crying, <laughs> but we prefer the term data. <laughs> Now, the types of things we try to do in order to elicit stress, uh, we would love to tie people to trees and you know, drive at them in our cars. <laughs> the Research Ethics Committee would love if we didn't do that. And so we've developed all sorts of alternative protocols, including asking people to count backwards in 13s from a very large number, or to ask them to engage in public speaking. Because public speaking is an incredibly stressful activity. It elicits an enormous stress response with, with regards to all the physiological markers. It's equivalent to doing exercise like riding on an exercise bike. The problem, of course, is that there's nowhere for the, for the, for the uh, energy to go, so that can be problematic. Uh, the, um, uh, with respect to, uh, here I am uh, stringing it along because I have actually lost my train of thought a little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, actually, I was, uh, I was going to say that people think that we can cope with stress. This is a very good little indicator of that. People think we can cope with stress when we do stress research. But we really don't have any knowledge of this at all. And we're not even particularly interested in it. So we just want to see what stress does to the human body. And we can maybe encourage people to avoid stress. But a lot of the folklore is interesting. Uh, some of the folklore is, uh, that you've probably heard is if you want to uh, eliminate stress during, say, a job interview or a stressful uh, public speaking exercise, you try to imagine your audience in their underwear. Have you come across that one? Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I can tell you that uh, from an academic perspective, there isn't really that much by way of empirical evidence to support that claim. And certainly, um, I'm just to let you know, I, I'm not finding it particularly helpful to me <laughs> at the moment. In fact, in, in fact, in some cases, I'm finding it slightly disturbing, <laughs> but I don't wish to point any fingers. Uh, one of the things I do understand from psychology is that we're constantly trying to monitor our impression, the impression we give to others. And when we're really deep in concentration, we let go of our impression management. And we do things like allow our tongue to come out. So when you're concentrating on a task, sometimes you stick your tongue out. And the reason for that is you're no longer monitoring how you appear to others. So when I uh, advise people about controlling stress in a public speaking session, I kind of say to them, Many of your audience are going to end up looking like slovenly fools with their tongues hanging out and their impression management gone to pieces. Another thing that happens is that uh, we are constantly uh, scanning our environment vigilant for threatening emotional cues. So when we do a face in the crowd procedure, we present people with a matrix of faces with different emotions. Using eye tracking techniques, we can follow like, where people's eyes go. And they're drawn immediately to the negative emotional stimuli. So this is a bit like a face in the crowd situation. So when I look at you and your tongue is hanging out, I kind of think that's okay, it's working, that's good news. And if I, my eyes are drawn to people who are scowling back at me, looking at, as though they're unhappy to be here, I'm thinking that's also a sign that everything is fine. <laughs> everything is just okay, there's no problem at all. Well, I'm particularly interested about stress because it's a, it's a biological reality. It's part of an adaptation to a changing environment. It is something we need in order to be able to respond uh, to the world around us. But it's pathologized. It is identified as something bad, something that you should not have. And this is very interesting to me as a, as a psychologist because this brings out all of the terrible things about human judgment and human evaluation. We have this area in psychology called abnormal psychology. We have had it for a hundred years. It's a psychology of the abnormal. Uh, it's the part of psychology that informs clinical psychology and psychiatry. It is the idea of defining normal and normal, abnormal behavior, defining normality and abnormality. The problem is, despite a hundred years of research on the matter, we still don't have a consensually agreed definition of normal or abnormal with regard to human behavior. So we have all of this research and this interest, and there are various attempts to try to define abnormality. Uh, the most common attempt in psychology, would you believe, is ask your mates what's abnormal. It's the appeal <laughs> to clinical expertise. And all of the diagnostic statistic manuals when they first appeared were drafted essentially by clinical experts who offered their assessment of what was normal and abnormal. 
And what we see 50 years ago in the first diagnostic and statistical manuals published by the American Psychiatric Association are things like homosexuality listed as a diagnosis available to clinicians to give to a patient whom they determine to be mentally ill. Now we don't have homosexuality in the current version of the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, and obviously that's the case. But I feel sometimes that psychology is still tiptoeing and inclined to tiptoe around the issue of homosexuality. We're not supposed to say things like gay people and gay man in our research reports. We are encouraged to use euphemisms like men who have sex with men or MSM. <laughs> now the other day, the other day I saw Jeremy Corbyn tweeting angrily about MSM and offering the view that they were the, 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 the pit of inhumanity and a disgrace to society. But he was talking about the mainstream media. <laughs> uh, not, not, not MSM as we would use it. And when we have this contortion of a phrase in the title of our paper, we're not supposed to use abbreviations. So we end up with papers with titles like Men Who Have Sex With Men in Norway, because they're talking about a sample of Norwegian gay men or men who have sex with men with depression. And one, re that's, that's funny too, you can laugh. <laughs> and one report in, by UNAIDS um, uh, reported on a study conducted uh, where they recruited a gay social worker to conduct interviews with members of the LGBT community. And they described this person in the methods section as a man who has sex with men with social work training. <laughs> Now, it's not just homosexuality that gets pathologized. Heterosexuality is also given a bad rap in the history of psychiatry. In the late 19th century, the American Journal of Obstetrics concluded that up to 25% of women in America required psychiatric intervention because they exhibited a symptom characterized by a wish to have sex. <laughs> Also, in the, in the 1880s, a neurologist called George Beard identified and wrote an interesting book entitled American Nervousness, Its Causes and Consequences, in which he described a number of uh, threats to mental health, including the trains, uh, <laughs> telegrams, and the daily newspaper. But it's a song. Uh, I beg your pardon? It's a song, yeah. Yeah, that's a heckle, okay? I, I... <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. I'm an academic. <laughs> I'll email you, okay? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll use academic time. So if you don't hear from me in about six weeks, heckle me again. <laughs> uh, also in the 1880s, um, Samuel Cartwright, another neurologist, he identified a condition known as drapetomania, which affected only African people kept as slaves in the United States the chief symptom of which was a sadness at being kept as a slave and a recurring habit of trying to run away and free slavery. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that when you launch an appeal to clinical expertise, you know, it's not going to provide a satisfactory way of defining normal and abnormal. So what are the alternatives? Well, people say you can use a statistical basis and appeal to statistical infrequency. Uh, if something is sufficiently rare, then it might be classified as abnormal, almost by definition. The question is whether it's a useful definition in a clinical context. For example, how many people here have flown a kite? Only a few of you, and that's okay. You're abnormal, however, because it's statistically infrequent. So I would just watch that. <laughs> But let's not try to worry too much about it. Statisticians provide a little bit of a methodology around this because they define any trait that is normally distributed as being uh, distributed within a normal range and outside a normal range, such that the middle 95% of any trait is the normal range. And the tail ends, the top 2.5% and bottom 2.5% are abnormal ranges, high and low. So the probability of being within the normal range is 0.95. And let's just take as an example friendliness. Let's just imagine you are among the most friendly people in the world. If you're in the top 2.5% of friendly people, that means you're abnormally friendly, okay? <laughs> and if you're in the bottom 2.5%, you're abnormally unfriendly. I'm not pointing any fingers again. <laughs> uh, that means that the probability of being within the normal range is 0 0.95. The problem with that type of reasoning is that we are made up of many characteristics. 
So let's just say height is also of interest. The probability of being within the normal range for height is 0 0.95, and the probability of being at the extremes, either high or low, is the remaining 0 0.05. But the probability of being within the normal range for both friendliness and height is calculated as 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95, which is a little bit less than 0 0.95. So let's take a third trait. Let's imagine your attitude or preference for milk. Let's just say you are the person who loves milk most in the world, or you're within the top 2.5% of people who like milk. That means you're abnormal in your preference for milk. And at the opposite end of the uh, continuum, likewise, you'd be abnormal at the bottom end. But your probability of being within the normal range is 0 0.95 again. So your probability of being within the normal range for friendliness, height, and your attitude to milk is 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95, which is even lower again than the last probability. Okay. Now you'll be glad to know I'm going to cut a long story short here. <laughs> because all it takes is 59 traits. Just imagine 59 things about yourself or about somebody else. And the probability of being within the normal range of those 59 traits is 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95 multiplied by 0 0.95 and so on 59 times. The total probability is in fact 0 0.048, which is less than 0 0.05, which means it itself falls outside the normal range. <laughs> It is simply abnormal to be that normal. <laughs> so what have we learned? <laughs> well, it's pretty normal to be, you know, to have feelings, to be emotional at times, to be depressed, to be anxious, to want to flee from slavery. You know, it's normal to be abnormal, for want of a better expression. And likewise, for very sound statistical reasons, it's abnormal to be normal. So there you go. Perhaps the real reason, the real point we should make is that using the words normal or abnormal in the context of human uh, behavior or emotions or cognition is not a particularly useful thing to do. Okay, so maybe we should give up on that side of things. You, your tongues are back in your mouths now, so I think you've had enough of what I have had to say, so thank you very much for listening and goodbye.